Thank you for joining us here in the RIA and for those who are joining us online at home. Um, so I want to welcome you all here as our Vice President of IACES on behalf of the Association um, to this public conversation with uh, former Taoiseach Bertie Ahern on the European role in the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. So by way of context, the 1990s were a time of huge change for the then European community and for Northern Ireland. The Single European Act of 1986 had set the aim of establishing a single market in the EC by the 1st of January of 1993. The consequence of this was the removal of economic border infrastructure on the island and an increase in north-south economic activity, as documented by scholars such as our own Etain Tanum, sitting at the back here, um, and Mary Murphy as well. So, I mean, the Cold War was ending, the power of military ceasefires in Northern Ireland in 1994 signaled change as well as we neared the, the new millennium. So our guest, Bertie Ahern, um, if he needs an introduction at all, had a front row seat to much of these events as Minister for Finance from 1991 to 1994, and then as leader of the opposition from 1994 until 1997 when he was elected Taoiseach. He therefore has a unique insight into how developments at the European level played into the negotiations which led to Good Friday in 1998. With the decision of the people of the UK in June of 2016 to leave the European Union, these questions have been brought into new focus. So we're very grateful to have Bertie Ahern here with us to discuss this in light of the 25th anniversary of the agreement and the 50th anniversary of Ireland's accession to the European Union. Um, pa posing the questions this afternoon is Dr. Giada Algana, President of IACES and lecturer in politics at Cardiff University. She is author of the European Union and the Northern Ireland Peace Process and several articles in leading journals such as her recent co-authored piece with Dr. Peter McLaughlin in Contemporary European History. So without any further ado, let me pass you over to Giada. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to our guest. We are really honored as uh, the Irish Association for Contemporary European Studies to have uh, you here and to have the opportunity to speak about uh, something that, uh, yes, let's say is a little bit uh, a niche aspect of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. So with uh, this talk, we definitely uh, want to assert the fact that uh, there is no dispute that the European Union was not a direct player in the negotiations that led to the 1998 Belfast Good Friday Agreement, the, given in particular that it did not sit around the table of the negotiations or that any of the EU officials um, participated in an official position to it at any stage. But, uh, however, and in particular in my research, uh, I think that evidence exists that um, indicates that the European dimension was one of the essential factors that helped uh, lock uh, all the actors directly involved into this new institutional setting. So, for a start, can you help us understand how this European dimension played into the negotiations of the 1998 Belfast Good Friday Agreement? Yeah, thanks very much and de delighted to be al along with your, your, your good selves and to be um, here in the Royal Irish Academy. Um, I think the, um, and it, it, it's good, I think, that we explore a bit of the European dimension because we've had so much debate and talk about the, you know, the Good Friday Agreement over the last number of weeks. That sometimes the European dimension gets uh, lost, lost in it. But uh, to, to answer your question, I, I think very much from the entry uh, of, of this country and and Great Britain into the European Union, and the dynamics of, of what had been the the differences in opinion between Irish and British governments was changing because, um, and this was helped by the European Union, because up until, you know, 1973, uh, the amount of contact and, and dialogue between uh, the governments was, was little or enough. Um, and it, it grew from the 70s into the 80s, and uh, as, as you've said, the, the single European Act of, of 1986 and the referendum that took place here in 87 uh, on that, 
the, the relationships grew. And I think, you know, there was so many subcommittees of the European Union uh, that Irish officials were uh, on with, with their British counterparts at, at civil service level, ambassadors level, um, that uh, that that helped. It, it helped momentum and it helped interest. And I think the political view here in my early years in the in the Dáil in the late 70s and 80s was, was very much that uh, the European dimension was a big plus uh, to to building a, a better understanding and maybe finding a way to uh, to to bring some kind of a uh, a closure to the to the conflict that was raging in the north during all that period. So, I think the, your, the, the first point I make is that European Union had a big role to play in that. It it wasn't to do, to do with the everyday negotiations that happened in '74 or happened in '85, but I think the very presence that people were meeting and ministers were meeting, politicians were meeting, officials were meeting, that was all helping uh, the atmosphere. The the second uh, point is that. From uh, after the single European Act, and, and probably um, we, when we were receiving, uh, you know, a lot of money under the Common Agricultural Policy Fund, we were receiving under the structural fund, uh, the structural funds that the lower present, the lower uh, started. I mean, they they were very very significant, and the European Social Fund and Regional Funds. I mean, they were all they were all helping the Irish economy. Uh, and a lot of people forget now, I think, you know, um, how, how all that was helping to change. I mean, it was the days of high emigration when effectively the entire Labour Party growth was, was emigrating, when we almost had 20% unemployment here. I mean, it, it was the European funds were playing a, a huge part of reskilling and redeveloping the Irish economy. And, and that was helping. And uh, it was also changing the focus where people in the north uh, like looked on us in a very poor way and they had better roads and they had better this and they had better that where they're nowadays it's very much the uh, the opposite from one time when you went north you said how great the roads are and um, now it's the opposite when you once you go you, you go north you say well what happened to roads um and then you have to slow down um, so it, 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 it's very it's very different to the way it was when I started driving a long long time ago. So it's it, it, it's um it's and the third point I think is is very important in this is that the you know I was finance minister when we we started the 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 peace funds money uh, and uh, at the time um, that coincided with the ceasefires of 1994. Uh, it was 93, 94. It was the Down Street Declaration, 93, December 93, and then 94, the, the ceasefires. And that was the commencement uh, of the funds. And of course, I know the funds have changed, and we'll probably talk later about you know, the, the emphasis and the strategic uh, importance of the funds as we went through piece one, piece two, piece three. But um, in the early days, it was more interreg, uh, you, you, as you know from your extensive research. Um, but I mean that that was the first attempt. The border regions, particularly the six border northern counties, six border and southern counties, which, which we were focusing on at that time, like they, they had really suffered because of the conflict and the troubles. Um, and that European money coming in at the start, you know, was a real help to trying to get you know communities to interact with each other, um, you know, to to start looking at. You know, what, what we, and it was, a, it was a, a soft sell at the time. It wasn't trying to push people together, but it, 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 did, it did help a lot in trying to get people to, you know, to see that you could do joint programs. Um, it, it did get Catholic and Protestant and, and people from nationalist and Republican areas uh, and unionist loyalist areas to start interacting. So, you know, that, that early stage of the money coinciding with, with the uh, what was the start of the end of the troubles, um, what was really really important. So, while the European Union, as you correctly said, were not at the negotiating table, they didn't need to be to have a considerable influence. Their influence was was very substantial, um, and you know from you know from the soft power uh, issues. So, I, I think you know the European Union have uh, we should be always grateful for the. Uh, the role and 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 the the, the you know, position that they took, and they were all supportive of 
of the talks. And you know, I remember even at an early date when I started dealing the 91, 92 talks in the north. Um, uh, Ian Paisley, who became a great friend of mine later on, um, but not 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 in those days. Um, he, he 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 and um, you know, there were three uh, MPs from from the north, um, and they 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 would fight non-stop um, when they were on the island of Ireland. But in Europe, uh, and particularly on agriculture, they used to work together, and they would go to meetings together, and. Uh, I, 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 I remember, you know, J J John Hume saying that, um, you know, once once it was about money, there was no problem getting Paisley to cooperate, and uh, yeah, he was right, of course. <laughs> it was helping his constituents, and um, so, so, but it was the European ground that was helping that kind of dialogue. So, uh, I think all all of those reasons set a context of why, why at the very start the European Union were very helpful. Thank you so much. And I am going to connect myself to this uh, uh, topic that you have already touched on, which is the peace programs uh, in Northern Ireland, uh, within which the Irish government has always been one of the most committed partners uh, into co-funding uh, the programs and to, um, into participating to cross-border cooperations and also all the peace-building initiatives that have been implemented through that framework. Framework. So, can you tell us from the perspective of the Irish government, first, what was the expected outcomes from the early days when this program started to be implemented? And if uh, the Irish government foresaw that the program would uh, be so long-lasting, survive so many years, and also surviving to challenges like Brexit, because let's not forget that the EU peace program is the only EU financial program that has survived the challenge of Brexit, in particular for Northern Ireland. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, that's so true. Um, but let, let's go back to the, to, to the start, and then we'll, we'll, we'll bring it on up to, up to where we are today. I think at the start, um, both in the in the interreg funds and and you know the the ninety four I think was the first the first um, peace one program, but at that stage there were no real connections as as difficult as it is to understand that between those border regions they were divided by by the roads being being blocked. Uh, I remember with Tony Blair traveling those roads when we were in opposition in 95 uh, and seeing all the, uh, the the communities that were blocked out and communities from you know from Manor into Leitrim and you know places that um, were very beautiful areas but they and th there was there was no um, uh, you know people in the audience of no towns like Manor Hamilton and into Enniskill and they like they were, they were cut off their, their their whole hinterland was was cut off in those days so the, the opportunity to interact, uh, the opportunity to, 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 to get programs going, community programs, regardless of whether they were Catholic Protestant or whether they were from nationalists or, or from unionist areas, uh, was little or nothing. I mean, there, were, there was nothing really happening in these areas. And just in, in recent months and years, I've been back into a lot of these communities and meeting the communities. And, you know, they... They, they've kind of, I think, now look back and say, you know, how did we allow that to happen? But I think the violence is, 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 is what caused it. And then the fact there were huge security presence, there was the watchtowers, you know, there was the whole militarization of the area. And, there was, you know, there was the amount of people who were killed in these areas. So the, moving then to the start of the funds, the funds allowed some of these communities and brave people in the communities, but with the start of the, the ceasefires, people started looking to see where they could set up programs that would get away from the discrimination and from the, you know, the, the, the bitterness of the past and start seeing where they, they, they could get something usefully going. Uh, and a lot of the early programs, as you know, there were several hundred projects put in um, and the money was substantial, but it was spread maybe, but thinly enough. But it, it did allow, uh, and the rules were clear, it had to be 
you know, had to be non-denominational. It, 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 you, you, you had to uh, be looking at initiatives that were, were building peace, that were building relationships, that were building contact, um, that was, were doing something maybe for tourism or for education programs. So, so, so those early programs, I think, were, were very, very good. Maybe the aspirations were higher, you know, maybe people thought, you know, that you, you could do, you could move far quicker. Um, but there were still a lot of tensions and you know, obviously the legacy of the troubles and, you know, a lot of people wouldn't, wouldn't didn't, had no interest in getting involved with their, with their neighbours, people particularly who were the, um, the victims of the troubles or families who were the victims of the troubles. So it was a slow, it was a slow process. And I think when we started getting to the demilitarization later on, I think it was probably in you know, 98, 99, when we started getting down the watchtowers and opening up the roads and getting the connections. That changed the, the whole dynamic, and uh, I think the, the, the programs became far more uh, efficient. But from the European um, point of view, I like there was 300 million put into, into these funds. There were several hundred projects. There were tens of thousands of people were participants. I think the latest program is probably about a quarter of a million people have participated. It's 333 million. It's a you know, seven-year program. So, you know, it's it's been it's been really powerful. Now, your point about how it survived, like, I think we were making really good progress. Um, you know, after the second ceasefire, after the Good Friday Agreement, when the vote, and I, we were making really good progress in that 98, 99, 2000 period. Um, and as I've said several times, one of the things that went wrong was that the decommissioning took too long, and, and that then started building the souring the political uh, situation. And we, I think, we stopped making progress. But I think one of the important things to say about the about the peace money and you know about the European money is that one of my huge fears, and Tony Blair's as well, was that after we left out all the prisoners in you know in '98. We, we said all the prisoners would be allowed in, uh, within two years on license, so if they reoffended, they'd have to go back and serve their sentence uh, and be, whatever sentence they had for the new thing. But because of a lot of the peace funds money, it allowed the reintegration of prisoners. And the prisoners, rather than them becoming a problem when they were released, they, they, they became the peace builders in their own community. And the amount of reoffending we had from prisoners uh, was, was tiny. Um, and you know, if it had been the other way, we would have been in big trouble. If if we had to release the prisoners and they immediately went back and started joining the dissident groups and, and, and back into murder and mayhem, it would have been a it would have been a disaster. But that didn't happen, and a lot of the the funding programs that helped to build community spirits and relationship, where former combatants started working together and uh, started doing programs to convince young people not to get involved in violence. That, that was, that was um, I'm not saying it was taught in, in advance that's what would happen, but it was a master stroke the way it worked out. And um, we're very grateful for, for that. Now on Brexit, I mean Brexit has been a disaster for everybody, we all know that about the only thing we all agree on. But anyway, um, uh, the, 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 the difficulty with Brexit is that uh, it, it could have stopped all those programs. And it, it could have very much, I mean, particularly at, after Lancaster House in 2017, where Theresa May said we're out of the customs union as well as the single market. Like, the European Union could have taken the view, um, well, we're not giving any more money to the United Kingdom, and, you know, Maybe we would give some more money to to, to Ireland, but it, it it would have ruined the spirit of of the um, uh, of of the peace funds. So I I think they didn't do that, which is to very much to the credit of the European Union. Uh, Michel Barnier, who came over here and you know was I, I walked border areas with him. I mean, he had a great knowledge of the border region. He knew the towns. He he knew the importance of the connections on a cross-border uh, basis. Um, so, and he had a big influence within the commission uh, of, of us not losing um, a lot of that money. And of course, he was the Brexit. He was then the, 
the Brexit negotiator, but um, you know, even though he was fighting with his colleagues in the United Kingdom, uh, he, he was quite supportive in that we kept the peace funds there. So, you know, the peace funds are, are, are there. Europe are still putting a lot of resources in. Okay, there's matching funds in. So that's really, really been a, in, in, important. And nowadays, I suppose, I don't need to say this to the audience, but nowadays there, there, are, there are fantastic programs that are cross-border, cross-community, cross-religious divide, um, you know, that involve you know, communities doing wonderful things. And it, it, it's helped. Um, there, there's not anything like the same tensions uh, that there were. Uh, those border towns are doing quite well. I know they hopefully will do better um, under, under Joe Kennedy in, in investment. But they're, they're doing well and they revive themselves. And on the southern side, you know, a lot of these... I was recently, you know, up in 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 Monaghan, and you know, some of the, these towns are really, really coming back to themselves, and um, the same in tourism in in, in Leitrim, you know, and, and for Mana, there's all kind of connection points. So it it's 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 really really working well, and I, I, that would not have happened. And we had we've now had Interreg at the start. We've had Peace One funds. We've had Peace Two funds. We've Peace Three now. Um, they, they have been hugely, hugely significant into bedding down peace and building local economies and you know, building up relationships. And so I, I really think the strategic, back to your earlier question about the strategic value, I think the strategic value now is coming, coming through because it's help and train and education, work experience, you know, and it, it, it's made an enormous difference to the border region. Thank you so much. This was really fascinating insight into the peace programs. Now, jumping, let's say, a little bit, bit more back on time. So there have been several references in official documents from the Downing Street Declaration, the Good Friday Agreement itself, to the UK and Ireland being partners in the European Union. So is it correct to assume that at the time of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and negotiations there was absolutely no sense that a political event like Brexit could have occurred? And back to those days, have you ever found any differences between yourself and Tony Blair in your commitment to the EU? No, the answer to that is a very simple uh, no. There was never a reference made. If you had went into the talks, um, whether you're a unionist, loyalist, nationalist, republican, or either of the governments, and have had said back in, in, you know, the talks went from September 97 till Easter, Easter 98, you know, till Good Friday. And if you had went into the room and said, you know, one of the issues we need to discuss here is what happens um, if the United Kingdom leave the European Union, people would have thought that you'd lost your census. Um, I mean, no, nobody, nobody from any area, and you know, we, we got lots of hundreds of, of you know, presentations and you know, group civic society sending documents to us and that. And then um, I, I, I even afterwards got people during the Brexit debate. I got people to go back to those documents and to see if anyone ever suggested it. Nobody ever suggested it. And what's even more interesting, nobody even claims that they suggested it because they know that they'd be telling lies. Uh, so, no, no, there was nobody, nobody in their right mind at that time believed that, 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 that and even people who hadn't got a right mind didn't say it. So, um, the answer to that question is, is, is no. And, you know, we, we always thought that, uh, in the Good Friday Agreement that the, the positive thing would be that Europe would help in a, in a positive way of building uh, matters up. And I, I, I think it is, it, 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 it is just the fact that it's worked the other way. Um, it, it, it's, it's unfortunately uh, the contact, um, and I think maybe it's something people don't think about, but every, every week um, for all the years we were in the European Union, and, and the United Kingdom were in the European Union. Irish civil servants were on subcommittees, on forums, um, doing research, engaging through various agencies, state agencies, and working with um, British civil servants. Uh, and there was really good contact. And, you know, it, it's no secret 
that Irish civil servants, when they were doing some task, they would obviously talk to their colleagues because the British civil service is far bigger and they would get ideas from them and get help from them. And it, it was, you know, it, it, down the years when we had a, some issue we were fighting in Europe, there, there would be a, a lot of collaboration and maybe not in agriculture because the British system was a bit different than different view in agriculture, but on most areas um, there, there would be you know, very, very close contact. And um, those relationships are all gone. They're gone. Our civil servants don't meet British civil servants anymore. You know, that, 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 whole, that whole system that had built up from 1973 up till a few years ago, um, till Boris Johnson declared that, that Brexit was done, or, or he was done, whichever it was. But um, it, 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 you know, that, that, that ended, and, and that was the, the unfortunate thing. So I think you know, no, nobody ever, ever thought that that was going to happen. And if, in the Good Friday Agreement, there are several references to the ongoing collaboration between the European Union and, and, and the, um, the UK and, and, and Ireland. And you know, we, it, it was done in a positive way that we would be looking to the EU to help us in many of these areas. Now, in fairness, the EU would continue to keep their part of that bar bargain. Um, uh, so I, I think, un unfortunately, we, we've lost uh, a, a lot. Uh, now, I, I have my own view about how that can be r replicated. Um, I, do, I, do think we, uh, I do think the Irish um, government and the British government should meet more often now. They don't have to meet at Taoiseach, Prime Minister's level. But I do think maybe if you were to divide the year into quarters, as we all do, that maybe one quarter there should be a meeting at head of state level. Um, another quarter should be finance economic ministers. Another quarter could, could be you know, justice, you know, social issues. And maybe the, the other, other quarter then maybe cultural um, educational issues, so that there is regular, there's a regular agenda throughout the year, and then if something important happens, they can, they can meet anyway. But, but Tony Blair and I would constantly meet at European me meetings. So whenever we were having a European meeting, we would always meet on the side of that, um, and you know. I, I, I never, the last part of your question was we, had we ever any difficulties with, with Tony Blair? I mean, I dealt with Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, and you know, back when I was finance minister, you know, I, I, I dealt with you know, British ministers for a long way back because I was, I was nearly, what, 20, 25 years going to European Council meetings in one form or another. But I, I, I always found that the whole EU relationship, with, working with the UK, has been a positive. A positive thing. I, I, I know ne negative views on that. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. Now, do you see any risks from the post-Brexit settlement, including the new uh, Windsor framework, to the normalization of the border and the increase in cross-border contacts, politically, socially, and economically? Yeah, I think the. I, I remember going to a, a conference in, in the European Union headquarters shortly after Brexit with Pascal Lamé, uh, Pascal Lamé who was head of WTO at one stage and also was trade commissioner, wasn't he, in the EU. He said, we have a difficulty and we, 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 we can't get away from the difficulty. And that was, this was probably in, in October 2016. The difficulty being that once the, you know, the UK left Europe, there had to be a border somewhere. Uh, and that border, unfortunately, fell, fell on us. So um, there, was, there was always going to be a problem. And, and that was nobody's fault. Well, it probably was British government for putting the proposal up in the first place. But anyway, let's leave that aside. But once it happened, it happened. So, you, you know, you, you then had how this was going to be dealt with. And um, you know, we've gone through the various phases of, it, of the, the backstop and the protocol and now the Windsor Agreement. You know, and I'm not saying there's not still problems or there's still not difficulties for some traders. And, but the reality is there's difficulties for traders in this town as well, which isn't always understood. I mean, you know, importers, 
here are finding difficulties as well and and now business people are business people and they'll always find a way around it and that's why more and more traders now are bringing stuff that's not going through the UK and there's all kind of imaginative ways it's amazing what's 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 happening and the reason the figures of the north south trade are so big now is because a lot of the northern traders are now operating their their goods through here and they're coming in from other European countries are coming up here. Now, I know this annoys some people in Northern Ireland, but it's just because businessmen aren't going to close down. <laughs> they're not going to... They want to employ people, so they're going to find it, you know, imaginative and creative ways around it. So, you know, that... that I don't think we can be blamed for, for, for any of that. So uh, I, I think the, you know, the, the trading difficulties that are not solved by the Windsor Agreement, that have not been solved by the Protocol... Are probably there. I, I don't think every if there's a need to try and smooth a few more of these, as I've been on the record publicly of saying, I, I've no difficulty uh, of, of trying to find, you know, more imaginative reasons to help, you know, or, or particularly help the unionist parties who who were who were worried about some of these issues because there's no point in fighting about them. We can find solutions once it doesn't change the the balance of the Good Friday Agreement. You know, once the balance of the Good Friday Agreement uh, is, 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 is not changed, I mean, the, the, there those people who make the argument that the solution to all this is to enhance uh, the power of the union. Well, I'm afraid you can't do that. Um, you know, the Good Friday Agreement is the will of the people. The people north and south have voted for it. So if you want to make a fundamental change to that, well, the best of luck to you, but you have to give it back to the people to make a decision. That's not going to happen. So uh, I, I think we, you know, we, we, if there are things to help people, and I've said this, I've said it publicly in the, the, the dinner in Hillsborough, um, when I had my few minutes of glory to, to, to make a speech at the end of that Good Friday week, I, I said it in front of Rishi Sunak, and Boris was there, and Liz Truss was there, and all the great and mighty were there, and I said, you, you know, you can make these changes, but you can't change the balance of the agreement because that's the will of the Irish people, and you know, case or So, so I, I think there are some problems. Let's try and find solutions if we can, if clarifications if we can. Nobody is against that. We shouldn't take self-righteous positions on it. But once it doesn't change what what, what we negotiated constitutionally. Thank you so much. And now I'm going to go to my last question and then we'll leave time for the people in the floor to ask some questions if they want to. But uh, so we have highlighted uh, a lot of very important elements, uh, starting from uh, EU membership, uh, the peace programs, uh, and uh, getting also to the divisiveness that Brexit has caused, in particular also within the two communities of Northern Ireland. So do you see a potential in the current, for example, Peace Plus, which I think is the big absent within this whole Brexit political debate, to actually tackle the societal polarization that Brexit has caused and the new north-south division on this island? Yeah, I, 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 I mean, the answer is yes. I, I, I do see opportunities, um, you know, for, for, for the, the peace funds to help uh, to try and uh, get over uh, the difficulties. Un unfortunately, it's not to restate the point again, but, you know, the progress that we were making um, in the early years of, of the agreement um, were, were definitely stalled. They stalled, first of all, over decommissioning of weapons. That was the, a major problem in the early years. And then it stalled over Brexit. So I, 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 I do think you know, there are opportunities for us to, uh, to build you know, greater, greater cooperation. And I do, I do think the, you know, the peace funds should be used now I mean, the, the focus, is, as you know, has is, is changed quite a lot now. It, 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 it's, it's more to try and build community spirit and to build, you know, partnership uh, you know, be, between um, the, the, the various sides and, and trying to get people to, uh, to move on in a, in a different way from the early stages. And I think that's the right, right thing to do. I mean, some communities have moved on very well. 
other communities haven't made much pro progress. So, um, but if if you look, if you look at some of the border areas and the border towns where the peace money kind of had its greatest effect, uh, the communities have, have are doing far better there. I mean, they are interacting far better together, and uh, the, the trust and confidence that was lost during the years of the troubles for all terrible reasons uh, is, is improved a lot. Um, and there, you know, religious people and non-religious people now are working to, uh, together far better. Schools are working together. Um, uh, I, I know this argument keeps coming up that if you didn't have segregated, segregated education, everything would be fine. But, you know, I, I don't get too excited about that because there's no good asking for something that's not going to happen in the short term. Uh, and that's the reality. Um, but what is happening is now you're having schools that are Catholic schools, Protestant schools working together. They still have separate boards of management. Um, they've extended their curriculum. Um, so if, there's, if, they're, if they're doing Italian in the school, um, the, the, the Italian might be in the Catholic school. Protestant kids can come to those classes if they're doing Spanish in, in the other, other, vice versa. Um, uh, they have coffee shops uh, where th the kids are meeting. Um, you know, they're, they're they're now working on cultural programs where, where, you know, I've been I've been in places where the, the Catholic kids are le learning the um, the lamb bag drum and and Protestant kids are are playing the fiddle. You know, even in the Shank Hill now, there's a hurling club, and and you know, uh, David Irvine's sister is running an Irish classes on the Shank Hill Road, so. There, there, are, there are a whole lot of, you know, maybe small, maybe small, but incrementally important initiatives that are happening. Uh, and I think, you know, that there's plenty to your question is, can these be developed and can they be built on? Definitely, definitely. And, and there are more and more of, of the projects now that are receiving peace fund money. Um, and we're very grateful to the European Union's commitment to, to, to that and to their research into it, which is shown where it should be targeted towards. It's no good just throwing money into something that isn't isn't having a, a beneficial benefit. Um, but but I think we're 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 gaining all the time and we're improving things all all the time. I, I wish it was better. I don't want to paint the picture that it's as good as I'd like to see it. It's 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 not. Uh, it's not. I mean it's it. It's, it still annoys me to go to see one side with flags up this side and the other side with flags up this side. And as we come into summer, we'd be painting one side, painting the footpaths green and the other, you know, red and blue. I mean, it, it, it doesn't, it's not getting anyone anywhere. And you know, re really, these are some issues that we, we need to try and, you know, get, 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 get away from. But it, it, it's, uh, it, it, it frightens people sometimes from the south when they go north and they see that segregation is still there. It's a bit like the peace walls. Uh, I think a lot of the peace walls could go um, tomorrow, to be honest with you. But there are some that are still that are still necessary. But you know, there 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 are more and more good things happening. Uh, and the, the subject of our debate tonight is, I think, the EU funds are helping to do that. They're giving focus to do that. Um, they're giving people the strength to come up with good initiatives to build on that. So it's it's a it it, it is a very positive story. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, again, without abusing my position uh, anymore, I would like to see uh, would like to ask to the audience if uh, there are any questions, uh, anything that you would like to ask. Uh, Niall has a microphone and can go around. I just was struck by your thoughts about how you should, the cooperation between the UK government officials and the Irish government officials and the, the ways that that maybe should develop now that we've left the European Union. So I wonder, just to put it quite starkly, does leaving the European Union mean that we need to revisit the agreement in the Strand 3 um, institutions and think about how we build those up? Um, to reinstitute some of that contact? Yeah, funny, uh, I've heard from time to time, including ministers and, you know, politicians and commentators, but mainly politicians saying, 
we need to think, think of something new. I don't think they need to think anything new. I think all they need to do is make Strand 3 work. Um, they, they, they could operate Strand 3 and the Intergovernmental Council without making any changes, whatever. But I do think uh, the, the, the two governments, and mainly the teacher and the Prime Minister, need to just identify the, the best way of doing that. And, you know, I put forward my view, the quarterly meetings, but, you know, it could be any other format, you know. I, but I just think there needs to be regular contact. <coughs> it is a crying shame that, to his credit, when Rishi Sunak went to the meeting in Blackpool in November, that was the first time in several years since Gordon Brown that the British Prime Minister had attended any of the Strand Three events. Now, um, I, 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 I don't want to be blowing my, my own trumpet, but I think the reason probably that happened is because I kept on in every interview <laughs> saying, how can, you, how can you explain that? How can you explain that? And um, Boris wasn't interested, he considered this stuff a waste of time, let's be honest. And he's entitled to his opinion. You know, if he if if he if he believed we were all a waste of time, well, he kind of proved that, you know, in, by his actions. So, I think Boris is probably a nice fellow, but not when it comes to Ireland. But he he, he he so but but I I just think Rishi Sunak saw the opportunity, and I think it, it just I don't expect the British Prime Minister to be having meetings over here every month. There's not no need, no need for it, but there is a need that there should be regular regular contact. Uh, and it could be done by different ministers, different agencies. It doesn't even have to be government departments. And um, there's no reason that that can't happen under under Strand Three. And you know, I think we need to show a bit of a, a bit of uh, effort on that too. We can't be just blaming the British on it. And, and and I think we should get on with that. Thank you so much. There was one question there. Um, thank you. Uh, I was just wondering, um, in relation to the uh, current developments with the DUP at the moment, their stance that they're taking, you've stressed the importance of uh, balance, and you've emphasised that quite a bit um, in the question-answer session we've had to date. What more do you think that um, the Irish and British governments can do to help to uh, further that, uh, uh, um, uh, or to further, shall we say, positivity and engagement and bringing them along uh, uh, with the, the whole idea of the, the, the peace process. There just seems to be that degree of unfortunate negativity. And how can we further that to um, bring about a more positive uh, um, outcome? Yeah, I, I'm fairly convinced that Geoffrey Donaldson wants to get the institutions back up and running, in fairness to him. And I, I know him for a long way back. In, you know, back in the in the bad old days of the eighties, when we were doing Ellen Hates debates in university, and Jeffrey was one of the few people who used to come down to those debates. Him and the Majimsies, so you remember them? They, they used to come down. So he, you know, he, I, I've always defended him, and think he's a good a good guy. You know, he. he um, so I think there are two issues that we can help him with. To answer your question, one is if there, if there are still trading issues you know where we need to smooth out the, the movement of, of goods or products or services and um, that can help um that that's it's an advancement on windsor uh, we should try and if, if they're legitimate we should try and deal with them uh, now i think you, you need the northern business organizations and they've done a certain amount of this but you need them to specify what it is that we're asking europe to help them with uh, because you can't europe can't <laughs> can do, do it so you know they, but if but there if there are issues and there seems to be issues I, I, i've been up in belfast a lot over the over the anniversary period and i have met some you know big companies who say listen there still are problems and some of them are solved. So I think if there are, we should try and de deal with those. And then there's the second issue, that there are, you know, within the DUP, some people who remember the DUP didn't support the Good Friday Agreement in the first place. They, they weren't even party to the negotiations. They left in September 97. And then we managed to get them back in in St. Andrews. And when 
the great Ian and myself m m made friends after years of abusing each other. Uh, so, you know, th but there are, there's an element in that party don't, don't agree with this stuff at all. I mean, if, if the Good Friday Agreement vanished tomorrow, they, they'd, be, they'd be very happy. That is, that's unfortunate reality. So I think we need to help those who are on the, on the constructive side. And, and, and we have to help them in every way we can. Um, so that, you know, there's no point in having a split in the DUP that goes all over the place because that won't get us anywhere. So I think we need to give as much support and comfort to, to the Jeffrey wing, if we can call it that, to try and get them o over, the, over the line. Um, now, I, I hope that works. I mean, there are some people who are sceptical and say, will it, will it ever work, you know? But I, I, I do think, having spent so, so much of our lives on, on it for so, so long, I think it's worth sticking, sticking with it and to see if we can get it over the line. I, I, my, my, own, my own view is that, that it will work. It might take us a, a, take us a while. Um, and, and, you know, Jeffrey Donaldson has assured me that it's not, because I said, listen, if I walk down, you know, Dawson Street and I ask people, will you ever sign up? The first thing they'll say is, you, you guys will never sign up to being Deputy First Minister, you know, in, in Northern Ireland. You, you won't play second fiddle to, 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 to Sinn Féin. I say, well, listen, the answer to that, and he says, no, that isn't their problem. But, like, I was there for the craft of those two posts. There is no difference between the two posts. I mean, there's Deputy First Minister, Deputy First Minister, the same position. Um, so there, there's, we don't need to have this debate about them in two separate positions. But even for the short term, I think Michelle O'Neill is it, it'll, it'll be there as First Minister. Somebody else will be there as Deputy First Minister. Um, I don't think it'll be Geoffrey Donaldson, by the way. Um, that's my own view, but time will tell whether it is. But there will be somebody from the DUP. Um, and we, we, so I, I think that's what we need to do, but we need to keep trying. Because if we don't try, nobody else will try. And um, I know the British government, that, as I said to the DUP, there's one thing you need to advise. It's a bad idea to have America against you. That's a bad idea. It's a bad idea to have the European Union against you. That's definitely a bad idea. It's a bad idea to have the British government against you. Another bad idea. It's a bad idea to have the Irish government against you. And it's an absolute catastrophe if you view everyone against you. <laughs> so, so don't get yourself into that hole, uh, which they're fairly close to it. So I think, you know, guys like me are doing our best to, to keep pulling them out of that hole. Um, and I think we'll, we'll, for another while we'll keep doing it anyway. Thank you. Thank you so much. Niall, to Dr. Mary C. Murphy, please. Thanks very much, Bertie. That was very, um, it was very interesting. Um, I have a question about, um, I suppose, one of the consequences of Brexit, which has been an increase in talk of a united Ireland and calls for united Ireland. And Sinn Féin, of course, has been to the forefront on this. And one of the things that they've been calling for recently is for the EU to take a position on the Irish unity question and to be uh, positive and explicitly supportive of the Irish unity project. And I'd just be interested in your view on that. Yeah, well, and the Kenny, in fairness to him, um, back when, after Brexit, he got the European Union to say that if the Irish people took a position on it that then they would accept all of Ireland and so I don't think the European Union can do any more than, than, than that it's, 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 it's left for, for us to sort it out <laughs> my, my own view is that um, there are two things have to happen before well for, first of all say it, it is de facto the position that the Good Friday Agreement uh, would not have been negotiated or not been successfully negotiated if we didn't have in it, the proviso that from time to time there can be a, a poll, or border poll, or plebiscite, and whatever way you want to describe it. So that's part of it. But my own view is two things have to happen. One, the institutions have to be running for a sustainable period, um, and they have to be working well for a sustainable period before you, 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 you decide to have a, a vote. 
Um, otherwise, it'd just be a mess, uh, and it wouldn't get you anywhere anyway. And second thing, and maybe even more importantly, but two of them are important, uh, that the groundwork of, of what you're putting to the people uh, is, is clearly negotiated. And we're, we're only starting that. It, it, this, this building is doing quite a lot of good work um, uh, on pulling together academics, and a lot of universities now are, 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 are doing academic work. And I think that's good. I mean, I've been involved in quite a few of these academic studies, um, and, and I think that's a very good thing that they're doing that work. But that needs to be done. Because <laughs> if, if we learned anything from Brexit and the Scottish referendum, not to mind going back to the Canadian referendum years ago, um, when I was younger, uh, that if, if, if you have a referendum uh, and you haven't done the work, uh, you, all you should do is create more problems, you know. So you, you, you have to... Uh, imagine going to the door if, if... Now, I know Sinn Féin have changed their position more recently. They're not calling for an immediate referendum, and uh, I think, in fairness, I give credit for that, because they were uh, they not a few years ago. But you imagine going to the door at the moment and canvassing somebody and, and somebody would say, um, oh, you, we're voting for United Ireland. Now forget about the money for a minute, which be, will inevitably be a big issue someday. But, and you'd say, well, yeah, that's fine. Well, how are we going to, to deal with you know, education on the island of Ireland? How are we going to amalgamate all the education issues? How are we going to move the Garda Shikana in with the PSNI? How are we going to get senior councils and QCs all to, you know, how are we going to bring um, the agencies together in whatever area you're looking at? Now, I actually think most of those things are doable, um, but they have to be planned and, and worked on. I think most of these things are capable of doing it. But having a vote before you explain how they're going to happen you, you might as well be out in the road there shouting when the traffic is passing by and you'd have a better chance of convincing the, the people, you know. So, it, it, so but it, it will happen, but the work has to, to be done. And we've been slow about getting on with the work, and I know that people can blame Brexit for a lot of that, that's true, and blame COVID for that's true. And, you know, you can blame it, there might be snow tonight, but, you know, you, 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 we should get on with the... The, the, the work, but I do think these things are doable. But having a referendum in isolation and without that work is done, in my view, would be a waste of time. Thank you, thank you so much, Niall. I, there are um, other two questions here, uh, Professor John O'Brennan and. Uh, okay. Thank you. Age before beauty, so <laughs> they say. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed, Bertie. I just want to follow up Mary's question about Sinn Féin. If we look at opinion polls recently, they reached a high point of about 37, which was about where Fine Gael was in 2011, so within touching distance of an overall majority. Um, now, my question is, do they come under more pressure if they were to get over the line and get an overall majority, that their supporters, in other words, would be just making that extra effort to demand the premature referendum? And how do they go about sort of fending off that sort of pressure if they're in the position where they have an overall majority? I think that's still very much in doubt, by the way, but it's a genuine question, I think, that's there. And the second issue is about Sinn Féin and Europe. Brexit, in a way, has created this realignment in Irish politics where there was really no division between the political parties uh, about how Brexit should be managed. But if we look back at Sinn Féin's engagement with Europe, they've opposed every single referendum, distinctly um, left-wing and oppositional positions to the ones that the mainstream political parties are bad. Do you think that in power, whether it's as a single party government or leading a coalition, that Sinn Féin would take a different position to the European Union than it has over many years? Thanks. Yeah, I, I think the two, the two questions, uh, um, I, I don't think any party will get a, an overall majority um, in the next election. I, 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 
I, I, I think Sinn Féin clearly could be the biggest party, you know, in, in, in terms of, of first preference votes. Um, um, but I, I think it'll, you know, the people will, will vote and then the politicians are going to have to see how, how they manage the figures. I think that's what's going to, uh, that's what's going to happen. Um, and by the end of the summer, by the time we all come back after holiday season, we, we'll see what the revision of constituencies are. And I think they could be crucial because with the population increase, you know, there could be, well, if you listen to the rumours, there could be certainly, you know, 15 or, or plus or minus extra seats, which is an awful lot of seats. If, if you take, you know, in our close elections or, or coalitions that, if you throw another 15 plus or minus seats into the equation, it'll have a, a it'll have a big, very big influence on it. So you know, I, I think that that's all to to play for on, on another day. But I think everyone will go into the election with their own agenda and then see see what they have to make of it afterwards. So, so I think that's what will it'll happen. Um, there's no doubt about it if Sinn Féin are the largest party, and even if they're not, and okay, based on three years of opinion polls, they probably are, you know, but you can't deny that. So um, they definitely will up the, the, the ante on, on, on having the, the referendum and getting the work done. I think that's, a, that's, that's inevitable. I don't think it will change the date, but because um, what, what my view of what will happen is you can call for it, but as soon as people think it's coming, people will start asking the questions, and then the the the, the, the no vote is going to rise, <laughs> and that's what will. Are you out in the road there, and you ask the first hundred people, are they in favour of, of a united Ireland peacefully achieved? You probably get ninety percent to tell you yes, and then you go out and say, well, th 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 this is the the terms. <laughs> then you won't have ninety percent, you know. <laughs> If you're lucky, maybe the ten percent. It'll be it'll be a change in game. Um, so anyway, time will tell. I mean, I've been on record as saying I don't see a referendum, you know, until the end of this decade or maybe even later than that. But I, and I, I still I still stick by by that. The, the other question is, I mean, I I was director of elections for Maastricht and Amsterdam. I was, you know, I, I negotiated Nice. You know, <laughs> Um, Sinn Féin were against every single one of them. I shared RTE studios and other studios, and Sinn Féin were always opposed to it. Um, in fairness to Martin McGuinness, uh, the late Martin McGuinness, he, he started taking a, a different view and influence in the Sinn Féin position away from, from that. Um, I think if, if they were in, in, in a position of influence tomorrow, whether they're in a government or um, leading a government, I, I think you'd see... Uh, that they would overnight become very pro-Europe um, because they'd realise if they were not, uh, they, would, they, would, they would lose their underpants, not to mind their shoes, you know. Uh, so so um, I, I think it'd be a very different, it'd be a very different position. Um, and I even detect that in some of the student debates I've been involved in more recently. Um, you're not getting those criticisms that you... You, 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 you'd be familiar when in Amsterdam they they had us in a European army and in Nice they had us in you know, but uh, all of that old nonsense is it seems to have evaporated like the like the winter time you know. Thank you. So we're going to get to the last question and then we can still continue our chat over some refreshments in the other room and maybe a nice glass of wine for those who feel in like. But please, thank you so thank much. You. Well, nearing, oh, since this is the last question, I'm going to risk a tiny bit of levity. And um, given that you um, are occasionally a betting man and have been used to being in the public eye, I was wondering, would you back Northern or Patrick Keelty for the late late? Uh, I, 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 I would put my money on Patrick Keelty, who I think would be very good. Um, he, he was in, in Hillsborough uh, when we were doing the, the Good Friday. And, and Patrick Keelty, as you know, can be a comedian. He can be very, very funny. But he gave a speech that night that was incredibly, incredibly um, powerful. Um, on, on, on the position of the island. So he, he has many, 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 many talents. Um, 
the only doubt I'd have whether RT could afford them. <laughs> That's another another thing. But uh, I, I, they're running out of names. They're running out of names. I have to find somebody before before August. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well. Thanks for listening. Yeah. No. Th thank you very much um, for for to the RIA for use of the of the room. And to Giada and to Barty for joining us. So just with a round of applause, then we can move through to the other room.